She entered MIT from Goucher College, and I guess before that she was a few years at the University of Washington, did a degree in biology. Her PhD with me and David Baltimore. Uh, just a bit of history, David and I uh, shared two large labs on the fourth floor of Building 16. My lab was doing a lot of work on messenger RNA translation, David with a number of viruses, including poliovirus. And some of David's early work indicated that poliovirus, this long RNA virus, was translated end to end into a long polyprotein that was cleaved. But there were many questions, and Lydia's in vitro translation work showed definitively, using some tricks that David Hausman had developed in my lab, that it, there really was a single initiation site for protein synthesis on polio. And indeed, it was translated end to end. And then she did some similar work with Sinbas virus. Then it went on to much greater things as a postdoc, first with Fotis Kafados, and then Tom Inyadis and Wally Gilbert. She cloned the insulin gene. And that was very impressive, because that was the time when people were just beginning to figure out how to use recombinant DNA. And she went on to a stellar academic career, first at UMass Medical School, where she got tenure, and then at Boston Children's, doing a lot of work, really some of the first work, on cytokines and growth factors such as insulin in the brain and their role in various aspects of nerve development and stability, and, and function, I should say. Then she segued into administration and rose at Northwestern to be associate vice president of research, where she had basically control of all the money, as I understand it, at the medical school and the <laughs> College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm not sure what else. And she did that for quite a number of years, and then was recruited back to Boston by Susan Lindquist when she was director of the Whitehead Institute to basically run Whitehead's finances, which she did wonderfully for a couple of years and then segued into the biotech industry, where she's been ever since. I'm sure she'll tell you about this neat company she has that I guess I can best describe as facts on a chip. Yeah, and uh, you know, using nanofluidics and stuff to separate cells, very high purity at very high rates. And you know, besides all that, she's been a truly wonderful member of the scientific community, uh, encouraging women, minorities, pretty much everybody to excel from very early stages in science and math and technology, and I'm sure she'll talk about that. Just two little vignettes. I remember, well, the first time I visited, uh, and she's still a good friend, I should say that. That's very important. <laughs> and a valued colleague. In fact, um, in, in one sense, she's my boss because she's on the board of the Mass Life Sciences Center, which is the, uh, this is, she's appointed by the governor, basically, to oversee this $100 million a year appropriation in the life sciences. And I'm on the scientific advisory board, so in a sense, I, I report to Lydia. Um, she can fire me at any time. Uh, um, but just two small vignettes. Uh, first time we visited her house, she and Tony, her husband, um, it was a small, I don't know, couple of bedroom house in Jamaica Plain. And you walk in and it was startling because right in the middle of the living room was a water bed. And all of what normal people would use as bedrooms were, of course, offices. <laughs> Tony being a physician. Um, and yeah, let me stop there. <laughs> Lydia, we want to hear all about you. <laughs> Um, let me untangle myself and turn me off. There we go. Okay. I think. What I do? I have to sit down. You can if you want. I think I'll walk. <laughs> I can see you if if I walk. I'll just move these back so I can stand sort of centrally. It's a great pleasure to be here. MIT. I've told people here. I've told people around. The world really that uh, if I could have stayed in graduate school at MIT forever, I would probably still be here. It was an absolutely wonderful experience. And I understand from the uh, mandate that Mandana gave me was that this is a conversation about how uh, I came to be where I am and why it is that I ended up at MIT and what that has meant throughout my career. And so that is what I'll do. 
I'll start briefly by saying that I come from a very large family in New Mexico. It's a Mexican-American family. I'm the eldest of eight. I have over 100 first cousins. Um, I have uh, 17 nieces and nephews, 18 going on 22, grandnieces and nephews. Um, and recently, one of my father's remaining brothers died, went to his memorial service, and I saw cousins that I hadn't seen for 50 years. So I, it's a loud, noisy family. And we lived, I grew up in a small house. So I think that one of the initial impetuses I had to be a scientist was this uh, vision I had of a large, quiet, small, uh, white room where there wasn't just me working quietly and peacefully alone. <laughs> Of course, that's totally wrong. But it did get me started thinking about possibilities uh, in science. I never wanted to be a doctor. Um, I did end up in a mixed marriage, mind you, since my husband is a doctor and I am at PhD. So as I began to learn more about science, I, I was an uh, avid reader. And I was one of those kids who liked to take things apart and try stuff. I think my first experiment was conducted by my younger brother and I when I was about six or seven where we took a squirt gun and squirted all the bulbs in the house <clears throat> and determined that if the bulb was on and had been on for a while, it was likely to break. And if it had been off, it didn't. So that was perhaps my first unreported scientific finding. Uh, I was encouraged by my parents, which is really very interesting, because in the Mexican-American culture, young women are not often encouraged to go off to school. And in fact, when I headed for college, my father's oldest brother, Jesus, came to him and said, uh, what's going on here? How come she's, you know, she's, you're letting her, one, go out of the state, and two, go to college. What about Richard? He's coming up next. And my father said, you know, this is my daughter, and she wants to do this, and I'm encouraging her to do it. Now, what I learned later, my uncle Jesus had 17 children of his own. So he accounted for a great many of those 100 first cousins. And he finished third grade. My father had 15 siblings, 11 of which survived to adulthood. And he was right in the middle. And for reasons that are not clear to me, at least, his mother decided that he would be the one who would go to college. My dad and all of his brothers and his, my grandfather, who came from Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, uh, played instruments. And they learned it by ear. Dad initially didn't know how to read music, but he was playing for dances uh, to earn spending money. A teacher found him and taught him how to read music and how to hold the violin properly. The Second World War allowed him to go to college because that paid for the tuition. So his mother's wish became reality. She died two years before I was born of diabetes in a, in a time in 1945, which was before <laughs> insulin was available, at least to her. So all of the elements were there. There was diabetes in the family. A father who was the first to go to college in his family. My mother was also the first to go to college in her family. My maternal grandfather sent his daughters through high school, but not his sons. He ran a ranch in Arizona initially, and he wanted his sons to be able to count the cattle and keep track of books and sign contracts, but he didn't think they needed to know much more than that. But his daughters, he did not want them to marry cowboys, so he sent them to school. <laughs> As a result, you know, Margaret Mead says it takes three generations to get somebody into the uh, higher degree. And so my grandmother went to high school, my mother finished college, and I got the graduate degree. And afterwards, in my father's family, he was the first to go to college. All of his siblings that are older than he only went through grade school, and some didn't finish grade school, and all his younger siblings went to college. And their children have all gone to college, and we have doctors and lawyers and judges and all that stuff now. So we've become well integrated into the country, which is a good reason to welcome immigrants. Um, just an aside, I learned recently that when my grandfather came to this country, he was crossing across the border regularly. Uh, at the time, you paid a nickel at the bridge at the Rio Grande River, and that got you into the United States. And so he'd come and work, and then he'd go home and take, you know, take care of his family. The Mexican Revolution was warring, uh, beginning, and on his way home during that time, there would have been a battle, and people would be dead on the ground, and there would be guns. So he would pick up the guns, and he would sell them to whoever would buy them, both sides, the Federales and the uh, bandits as well. So both sides came after him, and that's why my grandfather emigrated to the United States. <laughs> he was a gun runner, what can I say? 
Well, that's it. I went off to college and I did not want to go to school in New Mexico because I think, I, although I didn't, I don't think I could have articulated it at the time. But I felt that if I went to school in New Mexico, I would never leave New Mexico. And so the obvious thing to do was to go to Seattle because my father had a brother there. Uh, and so I could go to Seattle. Of course, I didn't have any money to go to college. Um, and I hadn't, didn't have any savings either. I worked summers, I was a waitress, uh, but the family took the tips because it was pretty essential to just, the, my parents were not terribly savvy financially and we always seemed to be living a little bit on the edge. So when I was, I, got accept, I only applied to the University of Washington in Seattle, I was accepted. Uh, I got a postcard that said that tuition had gone up by $25 and I was very discouraged. I went to my dad, he was mowing the lawn and I said, Dad, you know, maybe I ought to take that scholarship at UNM, the University of New Mexico. I could live at home. It wouldn't be so expensive. And so he stopped and he wiped his brow and he said, Eha, how much money do you have to go to college now? I said, Well, you should know. I don't have any. He said, Well, what difference is $25 going to make? <laughs> so I said, Well, it's got a point. And as has often happened, a teacher in my grade school took me to a friend of hers who had a fair amount of money, and that woman gave me $300, which got me to Seattle and paid for the initial books and stuff. I found a job. Uh, my roommate and I took turns uh, uh, cashing bad checks to pay for our books because our financial aid always came after we had to buy books. And so I got involved there, and I began as a chemistry major. Uh, but I didn't stay a chemistry major because I was having real problems in chemistry, problems which I might say were repeated when I got here as a grad student. Um, and so I went to my advisor in the chemistry department, whose name I cannot remember, I wish I could, and said to him, you know, I'm having some real difficulties here. Um, that was a class, as I recall, there was a 100 point scale, the highest grade was seven or eight. Um, and I think I got a two or something. So he said, well, of course you're having trouble with chemistry, women don't belong in chemistry. And I said, oh, OK. And I went and changed my major, not knowing really much better than that. And I changed majors several times before the biology department at UNM got modern. And we had a cadre of young faculty come in who developed, I went there later, I'll get there, <laughs> uh, who developed a spectacular course in, in, in modern biology. And that turned me back into biology. And that was that. But then I met Tony, this guy that Harvey mentioned, who was a senior in medical school at the time. And so he was going off to uh, uh, Washington, D.C. to be in the, in, uh, there. It was during the Vietnam War, and, and he would, it was go to NIH or be drafted. So I transferred, and my advisors at the University of Washington suggested I go to Johns Hopkins. I couldn't go to Hopkins. Hopkins was all male at the time. That's how I ended up at Goucher. Um, and that was a very small school. University of Washington is very big. Goucher College uh, still is, and at the time it was a woman's college and it's very small, 1,000 students total. And it was wonderful for me. There they got me involved at NIH in uh, summer programs and Loretta Levy, who was my mentor there, was writing uh, references for me when I was applying to graduate school because we knew we were going to come to Boston. And so she took a look at my references and said, okay, I see Tufts, I see several programs for Harvard, I see BU, I see Boston College, where's MIT? And I said, um, I didn't apply to MIT. And she said, why not? I said, well, I'm not so great at math. You know, and all those guys at MIT, they run around with slide rules and stuff. I don't think it's the place for me. So Loretta said, MIT has the best molecular biology department in the world these days. If you're serious about that science, you have to apply to MIT. Um, and so I did. Uh, and she wrote the reference, and I think it's because Loretta knew uh, Boris Magasanic. I've never really known. But in any event, it was a good thing that I applied because no other school in Boston accepted me. <laughs> MIT was the only school that accepted me in the graduate program. And when I got here, it was Salvador Luria, whose uh, picture is out there, who welcomed the incoming class, which was very small. So it was just amazing to get here because what I found at MIT was a place where students and faculty were colleagues. We all ate lunch in the uh, faculty lounge. Uh, we talked. We were junior colleagues, to be sure, 
but we were colleagues. And at the time, we didn't do rotations. There was pretty much two years of, of classes, and then we picked the laboratory and, and went into it, if the lab would take us. We were a very small, tight class. So we got together and we did two things. The first thing we did was to say, we don't really like the form of prelims, the, the preliminary examination, the first one. How about faculty, several of us got together, said, how about we go up to the cabin in the woods and have a, a, a long seminar. We'll present papers and we'll talk about them and we'll challenge them and we'll cook for ourselves. And the faculty said, yes. So we did that. The second thing we did was to sit down and discuss as students what laboratories we wanted to go into. And we worked out any uh, conflicts that we might have had because we knew which labs were crowded and which wouldn't. And uh, now Harvey's going to hear something that he may not have heard before, which is that I decided I wanted to work in, in Baltimore lab on, uh, uh, he was working on tumor viruses and polioviruses. And I went to see David and he said, no, nope, I don't have any room in my lab. So then I went to see, I, I thought about it a bit and I went to see Harvey and actually I talked to people in the laboratory because they were really a joint laboratory at the time and came up with a project which would involve both of them, went to Harvey and said, you know, it'd really be fun to do protein synthesis about viruses. What about that? And we could do it with David's lab. And Harvey was very enthusiastic. So I went back to David and David said, fine. And that's how I ended up as, I believe I was the first graduate student to have the dual uh, uh, signatures on my thesis. And it was Tom Rajmandari who provided the formal methionyl tRNA that allowed us to show that poliovirus was translated as a single entity. So I learned here the value of collaboration. I also learned discipline in a way that was uh, fun because you know, the, when we walked into biochemistry, which was taught by Gene Brown, um, Gene told us, you know, I'm easy. All my, all my tests are open book, uh, so you know, don't worry about things. Just, but you, know, you, just, you have to have the right answers. What he didn't tell us was that you could not derive the answers from the book. <laughs> you actually had to understand the material. And Gene would give lectures, which I'm sure he still does, where he would start at the top end of one board, and by the end of the hour, he would have ended precisely at the bottom end of the far board. It was remarkable. In seminars that we would go to, Boris Magasanik would sit in the front row and go to sleep. <laughs> but if he didn't go to sleep, you worried after a while because you knew that something was wrong. And when he did go to sleep, as his question and answer period came up, he would arouse himself and ask the first most penetrating question <laughs> about what had gone on in that seminar. So maybe he wasn't really asleep. It was a very exciting time and I learned a lot, got a lot done. Um, I made a mis uh, mistakes as well, of course, and learned perhaps the most important thing for those of you who are budding scientists, which is uh, the necessity of remembering that it's the experiment. It's the question that you have to ask, and you have to ask it. My first assignment was to purify EMC virus RNA. EMC is related to polio, and we were going to use EMC virus because it, it had been used already in protein uh, self-retranslation, so we were going to use it first as a control. So David gave me a recipe for purifying polio virus and said, EMC is exactly like polio. This should work. So he sent me off, and I went to the lab. I made all my reagents. Uh, that involved running a sucrose gradient with detergent in it. Uh, and so I did that, no virus. And so I went to David and I said, it didn't work. He said, you did something wrong, go do it again. So I went back to the lab, I remade my reagents, I regrew the virus, I put it back on the, on the gradient, I ran the gradient, no virus. I went back to David and I said, it, it, it's really not working. He said, you're really doing something wrong, go do it again. I, and I said, before I left, this time I said, oh, do you think it might be the detergent? Maybe I should use a less stringent detergent. He goes, no, EMC is exactly like polio. Just do it again and do it right. So I went back to the lab and I didn't say anything to anybody. I just changed the detergent. <laughs> and I got virus. And that was a very important aha moment for me because it said, didn't, I mean, we all knew at that time that David would eventually win the Nobel Prize. We just didn't know when, um, but it's not, you know, not everybody is not right all the time. It doesn't matter how much they know or how experienced they are, you have to do the experiment. And that has made me an experimentalist in almost everything I do ever since. And that was critically important and served me in good stead when I went off to be a postdoc, which I arranged by myself. I, I had wanted to do developmental biology, so I went to Fotis Kafatos, came here to give a, a seminar. Of course, it was over in Building 16. When I was a graduate student here, by the way, 
There was no cancer center. There was no Whitehead Institute. There was no Building 68. We were in Building 16 and I forget what the, 56, the adjacent buildings there. Um, Harvey and David uh, were just starting. They were pretty much in the same class that we, I was as a graduate student. Jean and Boris and, and, La, and Laluria were running the department. So it was, uh, it was a while ago. Um, so when I went off to do my postdoc, when, when Fotis came and gave a seminar, I was absolutely delighted. His talk was really dynamite. He was studying development of the uh, polyphemus, the wild silk moth eggshell, which is a beautiful structure with complicated protein structure. It looked like a great uh, system for development because each egg, the eggs were strung together in a string and it was a developmental sequence from youngest to oldest. And so we thought we could uh, purify those RNAs and learn something about the control of those RNAs as they went on and off in that development. It was a nightmare, actually, because polyphemus has a genome that's as large as the human genome, which we didn't know. And those were the very earliest days of recombinant DNA. So we knew that we could clone stuff, but we were working not with phage or with large packaging vectors, but with some terrible uh, plasmid vectors, and then the most wimpiest bacteria you can imagine, Chi 1776, which died if you looked at it wrong. <laughs> so we never could pure, we, I never did get clones, and I'd like to think that later on it was the repeated failure of not getting polyphemus cloned that inspired Tom and to go develop another way to do genome pa packaging and developing the phage system. That's a different story. The, the, so that project didn't go well. And in the meantime, here in Cambridge, it was a very exciting political time. Recombinant DNA had become big news. The idea that you could take DNA from one source, connect it to another source, and, and learn something about both gene structure, isolate genes, learn about gene regulation, was incredibly exciting. But it also aroused the possibilities in some people's mind that it might be dangerous. You were making chimeric molecules, maybe you could make a super gene or something. I think that people who were seriously thinking about this didn't think so, but nevertheless, there were federal regulations, and Cambridge in particular was a place where town and gown clashed on this effort, and recombinant DNA was banned in Cambridge. So that meant that anybody who was doing recombinant DNA had to go someplace else. I went to Cold Spring Harbor with Tom and Yadis, uh, and tried to do, spend a year unsuccessfully trying to clone polyphemus uh, sequences for the eggshell proteins. But I learned a lot there. Now, so you have to remember, this was a very different time. There were no kits. There were no pre-made gels. Uh, there was lots of radioactivity. There was not fluorescence when you were doing anything. It was all radioactivity. In uh, the Gilbert lab, at, at, uh, we would take turns taking our 50, 50 millicuries of P32 and turning it into gamma labels so that we could do sequencing by the chemical method, which nobody does anymore. Um, we we're just beginning to understand how many restriction enzymes there were. So when I went to Cold Spring Harbor, the first thing anybody had to do was characterize a restriction enzyme. So I was handed a bug and told to go find out what it had. And what it had was BCL1 and 2. So I was the first person, I think, to separate bagel 1 and 2. What that allowed you to do then was to have access to all of the restriction enzymes in the Cold Spring Harbor refrigerator, which was the precursor to New England Biolabs. Uh, that set of set enzymes, and we would trade. Once my colleague Ayedis of Stradiatus and I, he was a colleague at Harvard, made a huge batch of HINF, and we traded it for little bits of every other enzyme that was available at Cold Spring Harbor. So that's how it went then. If you wanted an enzyme, you had to make it. Um, when I went to Harvard and got involved there, back there, when I went back from Cold Spring Harbor after an unsuccessful year of absolutely nothing happening, um, I went back to Harvard and Arja Stradiatis, who was, had been my lab mate in uh, Fotis's lab, said, I'm working with Wally. We have this exciting project. Why don't you join us? And the project was to, to clone and express the insulin uh, gene. So I said, sure. But this time, we, we, one of the reasons I'd gone to Cold Spring Harbor, besides the fact that I couldn't do recombinant DNA, was that Arja and I were lab mates and we were getting on each other's nerves. He was Greek. I was Mexican-American. We yelled a lot. So we'd get in the middle of the laboratory and yell about the dumbest things, the salt solution and the gel, you know, things like that, really important things. <clears throat> but Arj had remarkably good instincts about how experiments worked. And so in the end, we always pulled it together. 
So he recruited me into this effort, and I had a magic potion because one of the enzymes in the freezer at Cold Spring Harbor was terminal transferase, which at the time, there was one good prep in the world for doing enzymatic transfer of, of nucleotides to the end of molecules that had been made by, ah, blocking on his name. It'll come to me later. Anyway, and it turned out that the reason people here in this country had trouble making terminal transferase was because American cows are fat. And if you take their thymus, which is where the terminal transferase comes from, and you try to make enzyme, all the fat congeals and the enzyme is trapped in the fat. But uh, this guy who'd made this enzyme in a goat had used uh, Texas cows, which were free ranging, and they were very thin. And so he had a successful prep. It was the only prep that was successful. And he had made this prep. He shot most of this enzyme into a goat in an attempt to make an antibody, and it didn't work. But there was enough left over for people like me, and I had a little bit. So we used that trick in attaching the insulin cDNA. Getting that cDNA was quite a, a task because we found we needed to get RNA. Insulin RNA is made in the pancreas. Pancreas is the biggest source of ribonuclease. Ribonuclease is a ferocious enzyme. Its purification begins with concentrated boiling acid. So it's a little bit hard to kill. Um, so we found a guy at the Joslin Clinic who was, had grown a tumor. He had done an interesting experiment. He'd taken a rat and irradiated it to death, uh, or to the verge of death. And then he connected it circulatory system to the circulatory system of another rat that was untreated, so that the irradiated rat lived, but it developed an insulinoma. And that insulinoma had lots of insulin message. And Arge and Wally Gilbert browbeat uh, this guy, William uh, Bill, whose name again I'm blocking on. Huh. Uh, into giving us that tumor. We made RNA, uh, ran endless gels to try to figure it out on a gel that had no <laughs> resolution, basically, and cloned it. And I was doing the cloning here at MIT because Harvard did not have a P3 facility at the time. They were building it. And MIT did. And so Harvey and David and Salva and other people said, sure, come and use our facility. So I did, and we got lots of clones. And one day, one of the clones was, showed up in a control that it shouldn't have, because we had put the gene in the middle of an ampicillin uh, gene, so it should have been ampicillin sensitive. A gene that, a, a, a clone that came from a bacteria that I knew had an insert, and we at that point had sequenced it and knew that it was insulin, started growing on the control plate. Um, now, you know, having learned my lesson before, I did not assume that it was wrong, although that was a strong possibility. I assumed that we were getting expression of the insulin protein, which was correct. We were. I was very excited. I ran down the hall to Bob Weinberg's office, and I said, Bob, I have the most exciting news. And he looked up, and he goes, Lid, you're pregnant. <laughs> and so I went down the hall and told David, <laughs> who was uh, thrilled as we were. That was, I went back and told Arge, and Arge said, oh, don't even tell the priest. So we worked like crazy over six months and uh, published a paper in PNAS, and that was, that's a signal accomplishment that still gets cited as, as historically. Uh, it's a historic event at this point, but it's a, it's a pleasure to have been on that paper. And that really set me up for the rest of my career. The, in many ways, when I went to uh, Children's and UMass, my style of doing science was people would come in and we'd think of something interesting and we'd do it. It's really not a tenable way to do science. Probably not even then, and certainly not now. Um, a, a reviewer will call that lack of focus. These days in the business world or on the Mass Life Sciences Board, it's called breadth of experience. So you know, uh, you choose your label. And so it became apparent after eight years, I left UMass after I got tenure, because I figured if this is going to be so hard, and it was. Tenure was not a slam dunk, I want to tell you, because I, like many emerging faculty, I made several critical mistakes, which I advise you not to make. I was on every committee uh, that I was asked to be on. This is not a good thing, young people, old people either. Um, I never said no to my chair, and it turns out you really can. Uh, if you want to succeed as a scientist, you have to pay attention to that which is most important, which is your work. You do have to be a good citizen, but you don't have to do everything because the institution needs you to do things. That There are things that need to be done in a department in order to make it run, and everybody needs to do their share. But you shouldn't do more than your share. And if you do more than your share, you're not going to have time enough to do your work, which is exactly the position I found myself in. 
it was a medical school and I was teaching more than anybody else. I was on every thesis committee there was. And I was on many university committees. I mean, I mean, after all, woman minority. Well, who else is going to be asked? So you really have to learn how to say no nicely. You have to remember no is a complete sentence. It doesn't require any elaboration. But you can always say, you know, I know you want me to succeed and right now I'm overloaded. Or I really need time to do this right now. You have to take the responsibility to do that because the people who are asking you to do something have a responsibility to get that chore done. And at the moment they're asking you, they won't be thinking of your long-term future. They'll be thinking about the job that needs to be done today. So it's really up to you to develop what it takes to say, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now. Um, and it'll work, you'll see. Um, so then, that, for that reason, though, I decided, well, if it's going to be so hard, I might as well go play with the big boys. And that's why I went back to Harvard, which was a non-tenured position. And I had a great time there. We had a wonderful time. I had collaborators at the Joslin. I had collaborators in neurology. Um, uh, uh, Bruce Yankner, who was one of my postdocs, came in because he was interested in Alzheimer's disease. And we had a science paper that was the first evidence that amyloid peptide did have detrimental effects in neural cells. So it was great. Um, but I was also doing administrative stuff in the department there. And I thought maybe it was time to take a, a, a step back and ask what I really wanted to do. And I have to tell you, I thought I was going to the lab. Because I really loved doing lab work, hands-on lab work. I loved working with my collaborators and so forth. But I talked to some very wise people. It's another thing you should learn is talk to people when you're trying to make big decisions. It helps to say things out loud. You will say things out loud, and it will cause you to think about things that you might not realize if you just try to work it out on your own, sitting in your little desk, uh, not talking to people. Talk to people. So I talked to a lot of people. Um, and it turned out that actually, maybe it was time for me to do something entirely different and to go the administrative route. So I went to the dark side, as some of my colleagues said. First, uh, at, as an associate VP at Northwestern, and then I became the vice president. And it's really true, you do have a lot of money. That is a job that I loved. Um, and you have to choose it carefully. You have to be good at administration. You have to like it. Not everybody does. Um, and you have to be comfortable enabling the work of others. It's not your work anymore. Your job in that kind of a role is to enable the work broadly within the institution. And I, got, I really had the whole university to play with, everything from the humanists to the business people. Now, the business guys didn't need my money. And the humanists required massively small amounts of money to make them very, very happy. So it was great. <laughs> the scientists, on the other hand, as usual, of course, need large amounts. And we did increase the number of grants to Northwestern. And there are people there that I keep in touch with who uh, we did some interesting things with and got me involved in business, which I had been interested here. Because after all, when I was in Wally's lab, he was setting up Biogen. And so I watched Biogen grow from nothing. Uh, or two people in Wally's lab, basically, to the biogen that you see now. And that was a, an, a kind of a education that would be very difficult to get any other way. And it was very helpful when I started doing these other things. When I came back here, uh, uh, I was recruited to be a member of the board of directors of Transkaryotic Therapies, which is now Shire Genetics over here. And that was great. The first year, I learned a lot about how corporate boards worked. I was on the audit committee and the compensation committee, and I was learning a lot, and it was great. It's a small board, seven people. Um, and then we got an offer over the table, to uh, over the transom, to buy TKT. And the CEO really did not want to sell. And the chairman of the board really did. So they were at loggerheads. And uh, the board decided we really had to do something about the chairmanship because you can't function with, it, with that kind of, of war going on between the CEO and the chairman of the board, who is a very experienced guy from uh, industry. Um, so we sort of, Wally Gilbert was on that board, and he was, he was the obvious person to become the chairman of the board. And so some of us, if you don't know this, you should learn it now. Board meetings is not where the action happens. Board meetings is where things are finalized. Everything happens before the board meeting. And so if you are on a board, you really need to be plugged into that outside the board loop or else you won't know what's going on. And if you walk into a board meeting and you know what's going on, you're liable to walk out very unhappy. So we had, several of us had decided, Wally was candidate, we went into a special board meeting on, Saint, on uh, uh, Martin Luther King Day in, early in the morning thinking we'd be done by 10. Eight hours later, 
uh, it took eight hours, because Wally had made it clear that he was sort of tending to not wanting to sell the company either. Um, and so some of the members of the board who wanted to sell the company weren't comfortable with him being chair. So we did a lot of wrangling, and after eight hours, I walked out chairman of the board. <laughs> now, that was an interesting choice. I was the only woman on the board. I was far and away the least experienced in terms of corporate stuff. My fellow board members were, were quite marvelous in sharing their experience with me. And I have this suspicion that both sides of the board felt that they could manipulate me into doing whatever it is that they wanted. <laughs> but what I could do, which came not so much from my scientific background, the rigor came in there, but the ability to keep people talking to each other is from my upbringing. So I, everybody would talk to me even if they wouldn't talk to each other. I set up a process because we had to, we had to decide in this bitterly divided board what to do. We had to be fair, we had to, by law, you must do what's best for the shareholders. So we had to have a process which would allow the shareholders to make sure they were getting good value for their money. And so I called my mentor at the business school at Northwestern and said, I've just become chairman of the board, what the hell do I do? And he said, just remember, the bankers make their money when they sell the company because they get a piece of the action. Don't trust the bankers. Ah. So I said, okay, so what we need is a lawyer whose compensation does not depend on the sale or the outcome of the transaction at all. And I could get the members of the board to tell me who was the most respected mergers and acquisitions law firm in the country, and that's Cravath in New York. So I called Cravath, and I got a woman on the phone who had uh, done the Time Warner deal, quite a remarkable lawyer. And so we worked out a deal for a breathtaking flat fee. Uh, she agreed to come to Boston and do this. And I tried to get an independent banker, but that took longer. Bankers just didn't know how to deal with this. Bankers didn't work independently. But now there are many more companies who are doing this. So when this woman walked in, her name was Faiza, uh, Faiza Saeed, I expected someone that looked more or less like me, short and dark. In walks this tall blonde. Uh, she was, turns out to be from California, and she was dynamite. So we did end up selling the company for $1.6 billion. Uh, Carl Icahn came in towards the end of the transaction and bought 10% of the company at the height. The stock started going up as, because our CEO was out there talking to the press, which is not a good idea. Uh, so Carl Icahn bought stock at the height of the thing, and then after the transaction closed, he sued uh, along with a couple of other shareholders saying that we had not done properly by shareholders. Bunch of depositions. I'm one of those weird people that likes depositions. I, it's like a good tennis game. Um, Carl Icahn lost. Ha. Um, there's a whole lecture, by the way, in what has happened to this country because of the focus on quarterly results. It's not a good thing long term for what companies do. Companies are no longer part of the community that they used to be, and that's not good. Uh, I think biotech has been a little protected from that, but even that's changing. And that's one of the reasons that people don't want to go public now, because it's just the quarterly results thing is really a bad thing. So that experience was most uh, en enlightening. Um, and as a result of that, Wally suggested, when he knew I was looking for something else to do, that I go talk to his son, who had founded a company called Cytonome. And uh, Cytonome is building a cell sorter. It's a fax fluorescence-activated cell sorter. But everything happens in an enclosed system. So there's multi-channels on a chip. It's microfluidics instead of droplets, so that the fluidics can be separated from the optics, and it can be sterile, so you can sort large numbers of cells for, for example, bone marrow transplants, which is what our primary thing is, to end graft versus host disease, or at least ameliorate it. Um, and so I went to go talk to John. He didn't need me on his board. He needed me in the company. So I joined the company. John left the company shortly thereafter, because uh, he's, he's a serial entrepreneur, and he has, I think he's now on his sixth company or something. Um, and I went out set forth to find funding for this company, with no experience with that either, uh, just as the recession started. I talked to 244 uh, VCs and bankers and so forth, all of whom said, wonderful technology, fabulous team, no. So several of us kept the company going for two years, and then I found a partner in Texas who uh, loved the technology. He uh, has founded a company which sorts bull sperm for a living. It turns out that milk cows have to be replaced every three years. And so if uh, farmers would really like to make cows instead of bulls, and so there was this possibility for sorting sperm. And it's really brute force. 
you sort the sperm based on the 4% difference between the male and female DNA content as, as measured by Huxt dye uh, in, inculcation in the DNA. And it works. He has, he buys, I think he has bought every USMO flow that's on the market. There are 80 of them in Texas and now there's others all over the world. But he's limited by the speed at which you can run the thing in order to get good resolution in the male and female sperm. So we, he liked our technology thinking it might be useful long term and brought us uh, uh, John Sharp who is a brilliant optical physicist and had built the MoFlo in the beginning at Cytomation. Um, and John realized that in order for us to stay good friends with our funder, we better help them out with their problem. So we've built purpose-built uh, sorters, single uh, droplet sorters that are faster, easier to use, more robust. And now we have eight of, nine of them out in the field working 24 seven and a whole bunch of upgrades to the MoFlows to make them digital instead of analog. And that's made our company at least revenue positive, although not yet break even. So starting from poliovirus in uh, cells here in, at MIT, we've had uh, administration, business. There's also a bunch of stuff with law. Those depositions with TKT were not the first. Um, you can really do a lot with a degree in science. And what I tell other folks when I talk to them, other young folks and, and students in general, is that a PhD is a degree of opportunity, it's not a degree of limitation. You are not limited to that which you learn in the lab. What you learn in the lab is a way of asking questions, a, a rigor of thinking that will stand you in good stead with any problem, you just have to apply it that way. Um, and you can take that skill and put it just about anywhere and be successful at it. And I'll stop there and answer questions. Thank you. I just have to tell you one thing. We've been interacting for years, and what Lydia may not know is the reason TKT had to be sold is they lost a legal trial in Boston Federal Court against yes. Amgen, who sued them over what they were going to make a recombinant EPO. And I was Amgen's lead expert witness <laughs> that made sure that TKT would lose their case, which they did. But that's all beside the point. There's nothing to do with Lydia. But, uh, come on, ask your question. <laughs> Anything's fair game. Yes, Dick. You're only one person. As far as I know, you haven't been cloned yet. Good <laughs> idea. Uh, how do we get this kind of talk? in front of more students around the United States. How do we do this? Oh. How do we give them a chance to hear and experience? Well, it's being filmed now. We need to figure out ways to publicize it. There's, I, I don't know how many of you know about iBioscience. iBioscience is an online uh, journal that's supported by the Howard Hughes Foundation. There's a, a, a whole series of fabulous talks from science to how I became a scientist. I've got two talks there. Um, and people that you know and love and admire and respect are giving talks there. You should look it up, iBioscience. Uh, I also do, I, I go talk to students. Uh, one of the things I've done in my career is early on uh, when, when I, Harvey said towards the end of my career, if you go to the FASEB meeting, you can go to the Salt Lake City ski meeting. And I said, yes, in about two nanoseconds. And at the FASEB meeting, which is a gigantic meeting in Atlantic City, there was a little note when I got the program that said um, that some Mexican-Americans were going to get together to talk about Mexican-American science. And I said, oh, hmm, I hadn't thought about that. So I went to this meeting, and there were 12 people in the room. And that was, there were 17 Native American or Mexican-American sci PhD scientists in the United States at the time. Um, and I was the third woman to get a PhD in the hard sciences, which I didn't know until then. I met the first two. Uh, Elma Gonzalez and Deanna Marinas. So there we decide, I, you know, I got up and said, where were you guys when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do? I didn't even know you existed. And they said, well, you know, we have to do something about this. So we founded a society called the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native American Science. The first meeting had like six students and the 17 of us, and we've been meeting every year since. Uh, and this last meeting, there were 4,000 people. I gave a talk the year before, and the astronaut sent a message of goodwill on film. Uh, to Sakna, so it's, it, we do things like that. It has spread out to other uh, societies. 
I think scientists have to be willing to be more personable about their own experiences because it's really what, what grab people is the people behind the science. The science is very exciting once you get people into it, but to catch the kids, you need to let them know that this is a normal thing to do. And children rule out being a, sci being a scientist very early. I learned this from my nephew. When he was four, uh, he now has four-year-olds, but when he was four, he met his two aunts for the first time. And he went home after that meeting and he goes, oh, mom, I can't be a banker, and I can't be a lawyer, and I can't be a scientist, because those are girls' jobs. <laughs> So kids, very little kids, are looking at the world and saying, oh, yeah, that, I could do that. That person looks like me. I could do that. Oh, I, can't, I haven't seen anybody that does that. I can't do that. They, they're closing those doors before they even realize they're there. So that's why we should support things like the Science Club for Girls here in Cambridge and other things that get at. I've, after 30 years, while we have a lot of work to do at the college level, we really need to get into the grade schools. Um, and people have to be willing to go out and talk to students. It's very scary. Giving a, a talk to six-year-olds is way harder <laughs> than giving a talk to anybody else because they ask the damnedest questions. But kids are scientists. That's the human job. They come into this world and they have to figure out where their place is and how it works. And then something happens and we turn them off. So we have to fix that. Any others? So have fun. Yes? So I have one as a postdoc. Um, so you, clearly you are very successful in academic, politic, and uh, business. Um, so in your opinion, so what's the most important or like saying um, you should have to survive in this different environment? I think there's two things. One is persistence, and the other is to recognize that it's always tough in one way or another. There is nothing that is easy. Uh, so that's probably the first lesson, is that it, it, life is hard. So what you have to do is pick a portion of something that you really love to do and push for it and demand it and be persistent about it and try not to have tunnel vision about what it is to expand your horizons about it. Because uh, if you get stuck thinking, I have to have a job in a high research one institution on the East Coast in New York or Boston, <laughs> it's very, very hard. Uh, and you, so you make your life harder. Um, and if you really want to do that, then you have to pay absolute attention to the problem that you pick scientifically, your mentors going to meetings, making sure that you are on the cutting edge. If you want to do something else, then you have to figure out what that something is and you have to do your homework. I mean, when Wally was founding Biogen and when Harvey and folks were talking about their companies, the thing that was not visible, but which they were all doing, was their homework. Wally Gilbert is a very good, uh, he ran Biogen for a while, he was CEO. And people thought that he walked in and because he's so brilliant, he knew how to do it. Not the case. He spent a hell of a lot of time calling up other CEOs saying, how, you know, how do you do this thing? He read the books. He started following the business page. Um, he, knew, he did his homework. So you have to figure out what the spectrum of uh, opportunities is. You have to be open. I was not looking to, for a job in Chicago when I went to Northwestern. I got called up by a headhunter who said, got this great job in Northwestern. I said, Chicago, why the hell would I want to go there? Um, and this person said something to me. She said, if you are interested in this kind of a job, you have to look at this job. You don't have to take it. <clears throat> but you have to look at it. That was very wise, and it I turned, all I knew about Chicago at the time was O'Hare Airport. <laughs> now, there was a complication, because my husband is at Harvard, very happy, he's never gonna leave. So we commuted for seven years. So you have to figure out you know, what you can tolerate and where the opportunities are and keep your mind open to possibilities. And it's not easy, I know. And so talk to friends and so forth. You're <laughs> yes? Um, that's something I would love to take to children, since we're saying oh, yes. about broader audience. It is, do you think there's a basic level of mathematical skill that is necessary for science? I'm assuming yes, pretty high standard. Well, especially now. I mean, now, uh, mathematics and uh, dealing with large data sets is very much uh, the, the way to go. 
so that that's, it becomes more important. And I think my own feelings about math came from my mother, who had rheumatic fever and missed a year of school. So she never got comfortable with fractions. And I think she passed that on to me. I mean, we are learning, you know, that the effect of, on women and minorities from this uh, envir environment and the, the, what we do to each other, because we're finally as scientists beginning to learn that social science is a science, and they do know some things that we could benefit from. One of the things that they know or have learned is that all of us, all human beings, have this tendency, it's hardwired in us, to make instant judgments based on what we see or hear. And it's not cortical. <laughs> it's, it's, or it's happening at, very, at a level that we really don't control. And it's only when we become aware of it that we can overcome it. Math fear in women is one of those things. So yes, we need to go take it to, to students. Um, and we need to change the attitudes about it. And, and I, actually, I think you can pick it up and learn it. It's not easy. It's still not my first language, so to speak. Uh, but I, you, know, you learn what you need to do in order to do what you want to do. Lydia, I just have to ask one last question. And I've been meaning to ask you for a long time. Uh -oh. What gene do you have that allows you to keep your enthusiasm and sense of humor for so many years? <laughs> My first reaction is you haven't changed since you were a first year graduate. <laughs> do you have any idea? I have no idea. <laughs> I, you know, I think that's, that's uh, I am an optimist, but the, I think that optimism derives from a very deep-seated pessimism, which is probably culturally bound. Mexicans think a lot about death. Uh, and so I, there, you, you make a choice. I think one of the things, Harvey, that I think is another thing I've learned is that there have been many times in my career because of the time that I was born into where I was the only woman in the room and often the only minority uh, or something. So I adopted behavior patterns. People do not know what you are thinking or how you are feeling. They don't know if you're feeling uncertain. They don't know if you're feeling like you don't belong. They don't know what you're feeling. They only can observe how you act. So if you act insecure, if you walk into a room, you know, and quietly sit down in the corner. One of the things I learned from this faculty was you had to sit in the first couple of rows. Uh, <laughs> people will perceive you that way. And furthermore, it will reinforce that feeling in yourself. Because then as people respond to that uh, pretense in you of confidence, you will feel more confident. Uh, and so it becomes a nice, self-fulfilling, positive cycle. So I've often wondered if we shouldn't insist that all of our scientists take some acting lessons. It would be useful, not only in talking to the general public, which we do not do enough of, but also just in interactions with each other. So if you're not feeling confident, just pretend. <laughs> OK, with that, let's thank Lydia for a wonderful <laughs> Thank you.